the West has failed and China succeeded. The individual only has a meaning in, Confu in the Confucian discourse in the context of the group. First of all, I want to uh, really want to thank you for um, taking your time to uh, have uh, this interview with us, with China News Service. And uh, um, so my first question will be that, um, because you have recently mentioned in an interview that um, it's a translation from Chinese, so it might not be, you know, your original quote, but you mentioned that um, the USA has had enormous military advantage in uh, operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. However, they all ended up in vain. And you concluded that the key to winning a war is to win the people's trust, not just win the battles. Um, what, what do you think is the lesson for the US uh, inventionism since Vietnam? Well, I think that um, the lesson they'll draw from Afghanistan and uh, Iraq mm -hmm. is that they're much less likely to do something like this for the foreseeable future. Because both of them were such huge failures on, in every conceivable sense um, that uh, I think that, you know, that it, they were humiliating uh, for the United States. Uh, now, of course, they did draw for a period the same conclusion after the debacle in Saigon in 1975, um, but by the 90s they were limbering up to do this sort of thing once more. Um, I think we're in a new situation now, though, because um, the United States was uh, in that period of, from the 90s with the, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, full of triumphalism, uh, believing that its power was limitless. Uh, and that is patently no longer true, above all, of course, because of the rise of China. Mm -hmm. So I think everything is cast in a new light as a result of that. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, and then my next question goes to, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit about the domestic issues in the United States, because some argue that after what happened um, on January the 6th, uh, this year at the United States Capitol, um, the whole idea of the American exceptionalism, or um, if, if you may, a city upon a hill has um, totally fallen. Do you think that the United States uh, still have the uh, moral high ground to lecture on democracy and so on to other nations? Well, obviously, uh, what, what happened in America from Trump, from the election of Trump in 2016 to uh, the events of January the 6th, just before his presidential ter uh, term finished, created uh, a very different perception, both within America and outside America, about the strength and viability of the American democratic system. Mm -hmm. I mean, when there were many questions being asked, not least in the US, uh, whether Trump would recognize the election result. Of course, he never has recognized the election result. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the sort of minor push pooch that was tried um, was uh, not beyond the point, not serious. Um, but I think it does raise deep questions about the ability of the United States uh, to survive in its present form. Uh, it's, it's too soon to say it definitely won't, um, but this is a debate that America has not had for such a long time. Um, maybe the first serious debate since uh, the American Constitution and the establishment of, of the United States. Um, and the reason for it, I think, is because the reason for this, this threat is that America has been doing badly since 1980. Half the population have suffered either stagnant or declining incomes. Mm -hmm. There's a great deal of unhappiness. 
The country is very divided. The political system is now extremely polarized. And of course, there's now doubt about America's position in the world with the rise of China. So, you know, for the, for the United States, the whole mood to, to about it and within it has changed greatly. Some scholars um, argue that it's rather the political leadership instead of political system that matters. Um, and um, meanwhile, um, other scholars use the term uh, political marital, meritocracy to uh, de describe the fundamental differences between the system of China and the system of the of the of the many Western uh, countries. Do you believe that um, the success of China is rooted um, in its political system or in its um, unique um, political leadership? Well, I don't think either of those actually explain uh, uh, on their own uh, China's success. Um, I know, I know, I'm aware of this argument. Um, I would say uh, that um, China's rise clearly uh, is also associated with its historical uh, performance over a very long time, that we should not be surprised, uh, really, knowing as much of, about history as we do, uh, that China is once more on the rise. I mean, it's probably the only civilization in the world which has risen and declined and risen and declined so far at least five times. Mm -hmm. So why not a six? And, that, and then you've got to ask deeper questions than just a debate about political leadership and political system, uh, which is what is it about Chinese culture and cu Chinese society that has enabled this to happen? So I think we need to widen the lens of discussion about this question and not just allow it to uh, be uh, take place on the ground of political leadership and political system. Now, political leader, leadership is partly a function of political system. In other words, if you have uh, a certain kind of political system which is effective, it will throw up uh, or has a very good chance of producing uh, good political uh, leadership. I think we should remember that China's political system in some ways, and Fukuyama I think is right about this, displays more continuity than any other country in the world. In other words, if you trace the, uh, the, 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 the governing system in China since uh, say, let's say the Qin dynasty, mm -hmm. then of course it's been through many different phases, many different phases, but the underlying characteristics of it in many ways have remained surprisingly or maybe predictably um, very similar. Now on the question specifically, um, I mean, uh, I think that you, you obviously need very good political leadership. And I think China um, has had extremely good political leadership uh, over a long period. Uh, and, and you know, it took China, let's face it, from being 5% of the size of the American economy to, you know, in terms of uh, GDP purchasing, uh, primary purchasing power to overtake the United States. And now we have a new period, which is uh, reflects the reflects the achievements of that previous period in that that then gave China uh, the possibility of becoming a serious active player, proactive player on the mm -hmm. global stage. And that in a way it, it has been, that in a way was the, the, the mark or the, or the, the um, uh, most important characteristic and achievement of the Xi era. So I think that the, if you were saying, well, does the system work? I think you've got to say the system worked extremely well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, uh, by, by creating a governing class and a governing leadership, which has been extremely, uh, extremely capable and, and, and you know, perhaps this period between 1980 and, and 1978, let's start with 1978, uh, uh, and the present uh, is by any historical standards extraordinary uh, in what it's managed uh, to do. The one thing I would add to this is, of course, you know, nothing is static. Uh, 
country has to keep reproducing itself. Um, a party, albeit extraordinarily successful like the Chinese Communist Party, will have to keep reproducing itself. Maybe maybe one follow-up question, because, uh, because Joe Biden mentioned that the mission of the U.S. troops in Afghanistan is not for nation building. Um, but what, what I understand, I grew up in China. What I understand that the Communist Party is all about nation building to keep China, um, you know, uh, prevent China from being in the, um, into a, a, a battlefield of, of so many warlords. So um, do you think that uh, uh, the role of the party is, is, is what makes China so different? Uh, if you compare it with, with any of its neighbors uh, in, in the region? I, I think that that's obviously very important. I mean, I don't think that's just just the, just the reason. I mean, you know, China's had a very long existence. Uh, true, it's been divided uh, at times, uh, very important times, but basically the extraordinary thing about China is it's huge and it stayed together. This is, this is an extraordinary historical fact about China. Um, and so, this to me is about uh, it is about leadership but it's also about the, the culture um it's about uh ethnicity to some extent as well and about how that has played out in china over a long historical period if you're huge the size of china, like china the centrifugal forces uh are very strong uh, 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 so it's difficult to hold it together. So, mm -hmm. but the centripetal forces, historically over a very long period of two thousand years or longer, mm -hmm. have held the country together. Have always, uh, despite bad periods like, um, uh, uh, for example, from nineteen eleven to mm -hmm. uh, the end uh, to the end of the civil war, when China was very divided. It's all. It's never broken up, and this is an extraordinary thing. So I think that, you know, I I don't like uh, reducing uh, China mm -hmm. to a, a particular period or a political a particular institution. I mean, in yeah. this in this era, there's no question the Chinese Communist Party has been extraordinary, mm -hmm. and and there's no question in my mind that this era is probably the best era China's ever had in its history. Mm -hmm. um, but you know it stands uh, on the shoulders of a long history, yeah. and, uh, and 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 uh, and I think that the achievement of Ch the Chinese Communist Party, with various mistakes uh, uh, in the earlier period, uh, it, it's managed to find a way of governing, uh, of relating to the history of China mm -hmm. uh, and the characteristics of Chinese civilization. Because China is not an, just a nation state; it's a civilization state, mm -hmm. and this was very. This is this is. If you if you if you don't understand that, I don't think you really understand anything about China. Mm -hmm. And this is a great challenge, and the Chinese Communist Party has been so far very successful in this respect. Okay, talking about understanding China, let's talk about um, uh, misunderstanding about how China. Uh, you know, successfully fought against the coronavirus. Because last time when we, um, you know, talked on the phone, we talked a little bit about the Confucianism and China's, you know, the, the role of nation, the role of, of, of the, the state in, 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 you know, in a Chinese context, which is totally different from what we have here in Europe. Um, so, um, and, and we also talk about the lack of knowledge and, and, or acknowledgement um, by the Western, um, you know, you know, scholars or experts in this field, they just, you know, um, look at China, say, okay, it's a dictatorship and so on. Um, so, um, do, what, what's your opinion on this issue? Do you think that uh, that the Western world really need more uh, knowledge, more, you know, background knowledge to 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 understand China in this sense? Well, I would say that uh, there is a huge problem here. Uh, which is a problem for China, but above all, it's a problem for the West. Mm -hmm. And that is that the West does not understand China. And it makes precious little attempt to try and understand it. So, uh, it, and it tries to understand it, you know, in the present context. It, 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 
it responds to it in the immediate context, not in a, in a, a and it doesn't really attempt a deeper, a deeper understanding of it. Now, there have been figures in, for example, the United States, I'm thinking immediately of Fairbank and especially uh, Lucian Pai, who did make a really serious attempt to understand China. And I think Pai did, in a, some profound way, understand the nature of the country. But by and large, if you look, and this is, and I'm referring here as well to many scholars of China in the West, they really don't understand it. They, and the reason they don't understand it is uh, the West, Westerners have been brought up uh, to essentially believe that their way of doing things is the exemplar for mm. the rest of the world. Mm. That ba the, 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 ba the, the basic uh, paradigm, the Western paradigm is superior to all others. Mm. And the way it works, its institutions, its norms, and so on, have, are, are, are the um, measuring stick for other countries. So, for example, take a really controversial area like human rights. I mean, there's no really serious attempt in the West to think, to understand how human rights uh, operate in China mm -hmm. compared within the West. I mean, there's simply a totally different tradition because, uh, and this really goes back a long time, it really goes back probably most importantly to Confucius, you know, where the individual is not extant, is not the, the, the cent at the center, but rather it's, it's it's the group. It could be the family. It could be a wider group. It could be the whole of China. But the individual only has a meaning in Confu in the Confucian discourse in the context of the group, in the context of the society. Now this is utterly different. This is the opposite to the United States. It is not completely opposite to European countries. But it's very different still, and so th and here's an example where no one ever tries, it, hardly anyone ever tries to understand the hu human rights. They project onto China the human rights values of the West without ever trying to think. Well, what what does it mean? How is how does China think of these kinds of questions? Uh, and so I and I I think that more or less most of the arguments. Um, um, uh, circle, circle, circle around this question of a projection of a Western way of thinking onto China. And they don't, that means you don't really need to understand China because if you really think at the end of the day that you've got it right and they've got it wrong, mm -hmm. you don't really need to understand China because you just say, well, you know, do it like us. This is the kind of reflex action, if you like. Mm -hmm. So when it came to the the the, um, the pandemic, for example, mm -hmm. I mean, well, well, first of all, they shouted at China, and that was the first reaction was to condemn China in January uh, 2020. You know, you don't care about life; you you you're just concerned about maintaining power and all that kind of thing. Then, of course, uh, in, in effect, the West was caught with its trousers down because when the pandemic arrived in the West, in Europe and the United States mm -hmm. in March, by which time China was already getting on top of the problem, yeah. they were absolutely totally ill-prepared for it. But they've never been able, to be honest, they've mm -hmm. never had any kind of humility. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is really an ex a shameful exercise of uh, diversion and distraction. So they've never tried to understand how to, they, of course, at first, they, they, they condemn China because now look at them, you know, they're locking down, da, 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 da. You know, of course, now there are, there are many examples of this, not least in Australia, uh, of something uh, in some ways fiercer than what happened mm -hmm. in China. Mm -hmm. But then the question is, well, how did it, how did it, uh, how did China succeed so well? One, the government had a very good, clear strategy and secondly and something which is never discussed in the west is that amongst the people there was a very powerful tradition and sense of social cohesion 
and social solidarity. He, it goes back to Confucius. It's not even just the, this period of history. This is deep in the Chinese psyche. Mm -hmm. So that's why they did so well. And that's why the United States, for example, did so badly. Mm -hmm. Because they, you know, they don't have that sort of uh, uh, concept. So this is a huge problem in the West because mm -hmm. the West, the West is not open-minded. It's, it's worse than that. The West is not seriously curious about China. It, it very easily, immediately sort of, and he, it, when it does become slightly curious, which it did between 2000 and, um, and uh, I would say around about, let's say, uh, and prior to Trump, Trump, as soon as the atmosphere changes, then we're back, you know, they're back to not being curious and condemnatory. And we're in the cold, you know, a Cold War style way of thinking. Mm -hmm. if, if you talk about, for example, the, um, the origin of the virus, I think it's kind of been weaponized to, you know, as, as a tool to just to, to attack China. It's nothing about science and it's nothing about the, the real research. It's only, it's only a, a rhetoric. Uh, at this point. I think it's a, an attempt at diversion. They need to cover up the fact that they perform so abysmally and China's have performed so well. So how do they handle that? I mean, this is an international relations crisis for the West. And so, you know, so and they've really got nothing, no, they've got no shots in the locker except to, for example, go back to the origins question. But uh, people, you know, the, it, I think it's truly pathetic, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, really pathetic Western uh, government and uh, uh, media and pundits and so on. So not all of them, not all of them, but too many of them have, uh, have, have, have played this game. Um, I mean, you know, you've got to draw the conclusion, I think, from this period of history um, that Western governance is in big trouble. You know, the, what, the financial crisis in 2008, uh, and, then, um, and then the reaction to that, which led to Trump and the crisis of democracy mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in America, which has not gone away, nor has it gone away in Europe. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the pandemic, mm -hmm. which, is, which is different because it's a test of governance. It's a straightforward test of governance. And the West has failed. And China succeeded. So the the, the 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 consequence of all this is that China's um, that the, the West, you know, can no longer really easily boast about itself. I mean, for a long time, the West boasted about itself. You know, we have the superior system, we have a free system, we have a democratic system, and so on. And it really works. Look at our societies; they're rich, they're much richer than you, and so on. I'm sorry, but all these arguments are you know, quite rapidly, actually, historically speaking, losing their force. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, um, uh, then, then let's talk a little bit about, um, we have already talked about the, the, the CPC, and we all know that the CPC has recently um, celebrated the um, 100th uh, anniversary of its founding. And uh, we, we all know that in the past one century, uh, so many politicians, media, and, uh, and, and so-called experts they have in, predicted the coming collapse of China for so many times. I cannot remember how many, but so many times. And however, today's China seems to be, you know, more prosperous and confident than ever. So what do you think of the uh, 100 years that CPC has been through um, leading China and which role has the party been playing in the process of the um, the, uh, if you may, um, great uh, rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. Well, obviously, um, this achievement is, uh, well, of course, the achievement is that of the Chinese people. Um, uh, you know, everyone in China has made their contribution to this. But of course, to do something like this, you need extremely good political leadership. Uh, and, and the Chinese Communist Party has been a remarkable leader of China. I mean, you know, to go from where they were uh, in 1949 or indeed in 1978 to where they are now uh, is uh, incredible, in my view. And uh, 
so um, this is a, this is mighty. I mean, you know, the Chinese Communist Party, you know, think in the modern period at least, is by far the most successful uh, political party in the world. Sure. If we go if we go by achievements, um, and um, and one of the things that's very interesting about it is that you know I think because of the Soviet Communist Party and its uh, and its uh, uh, and the process of ossification, uh, communist parties have been associated uh, with uh, you know getting stuck, um, getting bogged down, losing their way, and eventually disintegrating, which is what happened, of course, uh, in the Soviet Union. Uh, but the so the Chinese Communist Party is utterly different. I mean, the Chinese Communist Party has has been extraordinarily good at reinventing itself, at regenerating itself, and thereby also reinventing China. I mean, look, you know, nothing is automatic. There is no there are no guarantees in political leadership. You have to keep moving with the times and always anticipating the possibility. Of course, Chinese culture is very good at this. I mean, there's a long history of this. And the Chinese Communist Party inherits it, that, that way of thinking, of, of, of thinking ahead. And, and so, I mean, the classic, I'm, I mean, the best example I think is, you know, it, it is Deng in a way, uh, the way he reinvented uh, the Chinese Communist Party at a low point in the period, in the post 1949 period. And he made two, you know, great reforms, which were economic strategy, the government's economic strategy was not just about a plan and government, it was about the market as well. So he created something new and it was genuinely new. At the time and subsequently many people thought, well, it's, you know, it's like westernization. Oh no, and contrary, you know, it was not westernization. They created a system which was quite new and different and unique and remarkably successful. We should integrate ourselves with the world. But it was crucial because, it, and it was very self-confident, in these circumstances, don't believe China could be successful. Wow, how right he was! If you if you look at President Biden's expression on China, he he preferred to use such expression like "China will eat our lunch." It seems to me that the the, the zero sum game mentality is still there. It's still quite popular in this. U.S. administration. So is it likely that the uh, U.S. as well as the Western world will try and finally understand and maybe accept the peaceful rise of China? Or do you think that won't happen? I think that, I think now what I thought in 2016, I expected Trump to win the presidential election. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I saw I, I anticipated a big shift in the attitude towards China. Um, and I thought that it would go on for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, these kind of eras are not short lived because the United States has prided itself on its hegemony, its leadership of the world, that mm -hmm. we are number one for a very long time. So this is a very traumatic process for the United States because it, it's, it's in decline and it will carry on relative decline. It will carry on being in relative decline. And the DNA, DNA, not just of the American leadership, but the American people is we are number one. That is a big, a big problem for the American psyche to surmount. So, you know, we've already been in this game now for five years. Uh, it's clear there's not going to be any great change under Biden. Might be a bit, but there's not going to be a big one. Um, and then, you know, then it's not difficult to see 10 years coming up. <laughs> and, you know, I would say not less than 20 years. Now, there is one, so, but I think eventually it will change. And so we're in the long game. We're not in the short game. That's why tit for tat's not good. If you allow me, I may, I may add up one point, because last time you told me about your reading about China's common prosperity uh, nowadays. Um, what's your take on this issue? Well, I, I think this is a very interesting development. Uh, and I think it's, it, it's sort of confounded somewhat mm. Western thinking. They're not sure 
exactly how what to make of it. Uh, I think their reaction is uh, because they're they're sort of congenitally anti sinophobic at the moment. The initial react the, the, the initial reflex action is to be negative about it, but uh, but it does but the problems that China is confronted with in this context are exactly the same problems in a way that the West is confronted with. I mean, if you take the, the tech firms, they've clearly got too much power mm -hmm. and they're clearly not sufficiently accountable. Take the question of inequality. Um, now, inequality is a huge problem in the United States, but everywhere, more or less, in Europe, it's been growing uh, steadily in the, in the neoliberal era uh, mm -hmm. since 1980. Um, and so China's trying to find ways of tackling it. Try, trying to find ways of confronting it, mm -hmm. or take the the problem of you know, the internet. Everyone, e everyone worries. Every parent mm -hmm. in the, that I know, including myself, when my son was younger, worried about how much uh, uh, screen he should he should he should use mm -hmm. uh, during the day. You know, <laughs> and every parent, every parent I know, uh, more or less. <laughs> Except those who use it as a way of, um, of child minding um, mm -hmm. uh, to keep your child quiet, everyone worries, is anxious, angst, angst about this problem. So this is very interesting. You see that China is actually trying to address these kind of problems, which are problems in the West as well. So um, I mean, I was reading a leader in one of the newspapers today here, which of course made the same points about you know the government, you know you know, trying to establish control, et cetera. They made that, that's the point they always say. But actually, they also made the point, well, these are real problems, you know, and they really need to be addressed and they really need solutions. Because it's I think really that's, that's the problem here, because you mentioned that there is a, a, a really urgent need for the both uh, countries to cooperate. Not, I mean, not only in, in climate change, but actually in, also in the pandemic actually, if you really think about it. But the problem is that just, just I think the foreign minister, Wang Yi, he, he recently said that um, USA cannot think that you could, uh, at one hand, you want to, you know, ask all your allies to, you know, come together to group an ally against China in, in many, many different regions. But on the other hand, you want China to, cooperate with you on um, uh, issues like climate change, biodiversity, and so on. Um, I think it's, it's for, for the Chinese leadership, it's, 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 it's never going to happen. It's, it's, you know, you are, you're, you're basically, it's kind of like blackmailing or something like that. <laughs> and, and also, I think China is not accepting um, the White House and the EU's a uh, new definition of China's, um, you know, relationship um, uh, with with the West. It's like it's it's a um, how to say it's like three roles of China. It's like China at the same time is a, a partner, and you cooperate when you can, and then you uh, compete when you when you when you when you need, and then you 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 fight when when some somewhere you became rivals. So it's like. China is at the same time a partner, a competitor, and also a rival, sist uh, systematic uh, rivals. Well, obviously, the problem with the definition is what is the relationship between being a competitor and being a rival, and which is the dominant player in the in the relationship? And at the moment, the dominant player in the relationship is the rivalry, not the the cooperation. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, but it's just a phrase, you know. I mean, of course, a phrase does mean it, it has deeper meanings. Mm -hmm. um, deeper thoughts behind it, um, and, and the deeper thought behind it is, you know, the American, the, the Amer America's uh, uh, incredible kind of America's nervous breakdown about the threat that China poses to its global hegemony, and that is the that is the organizing principle uh, behind. Uh, America's attitude. So therefore, the rivalry uh, is more important to America than the cooperation. Mm -hmm.